Hi folks. Okay, so uh, today's topic is anti-reverse engineering. So what we're doing today is we're looking at um, the reasons why and the techniques that people use uh, when they're trying to make it more difficult for people to analyze their software. So first thing we're doing is having a look at uh, the different ways in which these techniques are used. So they're not always used for malware purposes. I know this module's primarily anti-malware uh, a reverse engineering malware analysis module. Um, that this is not the only use case. Uh, they're often used for anti-piracy um, by legitimate software companies that are trying to make it more difficult for competitors uh, to look to like look at or know, understand their internals of their business uh, of their products. But they're also um, looking. It's not just that. It's also um, to do people. I mean, people will reverse engineer. Um, software products such as video games quite often in order to break um, not just video games things like um, audio books ebooks stuff like that to break um, and remove any copyright protections so there's some legal and ethical considerations we're looking at there and after that we're going to go and get stuck into the techniques so um, we're looking first at code obfuscation so that's making the code more difficult for humans to read and understand then we're looking at a bunch of attacks. So the next four uh, bullet points are attacks against different tools or that analysts, that uh, reverse engineers use. So we're looking at tools that target the debugger, things that make it uh, more difficult for us to debug, things that um, target to try and identify whether uh, the program is running within a virtual machine or a sandbox. Um, so that it can maybe change its operations in those cases in order to mask its behavior. Um, so then we'll look at anti-disassembly and anti-decompilation. These two are very similar. They just operate at different layers. Essentially the goal with these two techniques is, so for an anti-disassembly we're looking at attacks which confuse the disassembler. So um, for example, the disassembler is essentially the thing that converts the machine code into readable assembly instructions. Now this is, there are some issues, uh, and the, the decompiler is the thing that converts the um, assembly instructions into a, uh, a similar enough program list in, that could have been written in C code, like a high level language. There are attacks for, against both of these things, at both layers, which can, essentially you can inject code that is hard to pass by the, um, well it's ambiguously passed, so you can trick the, uh, decomp uh, the disassembler or the decompiler into producing an incorrect listing. It makes it hard to analyze, obviously, if you, if you can't even see if the uh, assembly code that you're looking at isn't actually an accurate representation of the machine code that's running. Um, and same goes with the uh, decompiled C code versus the assembly code. Yeah, it makes it very difficult. So the final thing we're looking at is runtime integrity checks. Uh, this should actually just read integrity checks because the, the, we're not just covering things at runtime here. We are looking at runtime integrity checks, things like uh, checksums, uh, so that when the program's running, it's like internally checking that the code that it's got uh, matches a checksum. Um, this is to try and prevent like tampering or binary patching, things like that. We're also looking at some that aren't at runtime. Um, so cryptographically signed code, as an example. This happens before the code's actually run, but it's just a way of verifying who is who the author is. The author is who they say they are, and that the code is uh, what it says it is. So, so who uses these these techniques? So, like I said briefly, um, they can be used by malware authors in order to make it more difficult for um, an analyst, a malware analyst, to actually understand what they've been doing. They can also be used by software developers and software organizations that are trying to release their a product that they don't really want people to understand the intricate details of. This could be for a number of reasons. It might be piracy reasons. It could be for other reasons like often um, you'll see in video games. I, I, I keep bringing it back to video games because then it's quite common like reverse engineering um, within the like the video game domain is uh, very common. People will, whenever a game comes out, people are rushing to see who can be the first person to uh, reverse engineer it and write a crack to bypass the um, copyright protections and there's always like an arms race between the um, between the people introducing new techniques 
uh, like anti um, anti reversing or anti analysis techniques versus people who then will be able to get past them. It happens all the time. If you'll you'll see um, whenever a new generate whenever a new generation of like video game comes out, you'll see a lot of people. Uh, you'll see them claiming that they've got some unhackable uh, anti-piracy thing. It happens all the time, and then it's just a matter of time, really, until someone gets around it, and then they'll bring out something else, and yeah, so it goes. Very common in cybersecurity. Um, so, anti-piracy. We're looking. So this is what the um, the positive use case for these things is. Um, so we're looking at it, it. Mostly relates to intellectual property law. Um, but it also relates so, so essentially intellectual property refers to creations of the mind such as inventions, literary or artistic works, designs, symbols, names and images used in commerce so software developers uh, can use similar mechanisms to malware offers in order to make it more difficult to reverse their products and the reason they do that is to try and uh, keep trade secrets secret, so protect their algorithms and the code that they've written from competitors using it, or from, from them easily being able to understand what the, uh, what, what the products are doing and then re-implement it themselves. Um, and also, to, also um, we're looking at preventing unlicensed use of software, essentially. So, some of the legal and ethical considerations of this mostly relates to intellectual property. So software code is not actually, uh, it's not clearly protected by IP law. It's quite a grey area, all of this. Um, some of these things, and they still get argued out in court often. You'll see things like, um, I don't know, there were, there were some cases a while ago relating to the right to fix your own device. Um, or if you own a, a mobile phone, do you actually own the phone and the code on it and the firmware? Are you able to edit and modify that legally? A bunch of cases related to that. Um, but what we're looking at, so organizations, yeah, they're, they're primarily using it to try and protect uh, their intellectual property and license. So one interesting thing, um, there were some cases so essentially, reverse engineering for interoperability. So if you have two systems, you don't know how one of them works, but you want your other um, system to be able to interact with it. Uh, you can reverse engineer for that purpose legally, it's all allowed. What you can't do is you can't uh, remove copyright protections if you're doing, uh, if you re reverse engineer a product, then modify the product in a way that re removes copyright protections, then it becomes illegal. So reverse engineering a video game in order to develop a crack is illegal. Things like that. Uh, same with any licensed product. I'll just keep mentioning. Yeah. Anti analysis and tampering. So that's the background. Uh, now we're going to look at some of the techniques in detail. So we'll start with code obfuscation. So obfuscation just means making s something that's, in, if you're obfuscating, you're making something less clear or harder to understand. I'm trying to make it awkward uh, to interpret. So code obfuscation is just doing that to a program. So what we're doing here is, um, so tools exist to do this. You could do it manually, there's no reason why not. But um, tools exist so that you can automatically convert a program into something that's functionally equivalent. So it does the exact same thing, or, or it, maybe not in the exact same way, obviously, but like it produces the same output. It functions in the same way, but it the actual instructions that you're looking at, the code that you're reading, is looks very different. Looks very hard to pass, hard to understand. And not pass for a computer, but for a human. Um, so some of the techniques to do this, um, we can look at things like renaming variables uh, to randomly generate characters. So if we had a bunch of meaningful variable names in our code, which we should have if we're writing good code, um, an obfuscator may just take all of those variables and rename them to something like var1, var2, that might even, it, it probably, in reality, they actually go further than that. They don't necessarily use sequentially ordered numbered variable names, because that's still, um, I mean, you can, you can use things like hashing, whatever the variable name was. Um, you could just use randomly generated hex numbers. Um, yeah, so another thing they do 
in order to make it harder to read is you can replace any, any strings within the data, any like ASCII printable strings or Unicode or anything, any, any printable string data can be um, replaced with either binary data or hex data or just something encoded in a different way. Maybe even different strings are encoded in different ways. Um, yeah, you could use things like Base64, anything that makes it hard to read, but that it does the same thing essentially. So you decode it before you run the, uh, the program will be modified so that it decode whatever format of string you've put in into an actual like usable string. Uh, before it does it. So another thing, replace integers with alternative representations. Essentially what you're doing is re replacing things with, you're just encoding. You're encoding whatever that original text, uh, the original code here is uh, using various different methods and it can come out looking very different. Like if you see this image on the right hand side here, uh, A, this is from, so this is from malware forensics, uh, an article by malware forensics uh, on code obfuscation in 2008 and yeah, it, so this, these two, A and B, are functionally equivalent, even though B is very, very difficult to, you would, it would take a long time for you to actually manually go through and try and run through all of this step by step, unless you use the debugger, which you could use. Um, but yeah, you would be able to determine eventually that those two are the same thing if you look at them. So, well, there are obfuscators for uh, all sorts of different programming languages. Some examples on the left, so Tigress is the most commonly used one for C and C++. There's ProGuard for Java, uh, Python's got Oxyrix. JavaScript has quite a few, I just picked one called JavaScript Obfuscator. Um, so there's uh, a link to a GitHub profile with that there. Um, there's one, an in-browser for Obfuscator that I'm going to show you in a second to give you an example, another example um, that you can actually play around with yourself. Finally, the last thing to mention is binary packers and compressors. So these are, um, I'll talk about this before I do the demo quick, but binary packers are essentially um, a tool which makes a, an executable program, like a binary executable program, um, can com it can compress it basically. Like a zip file compresses a standard file, makes a, a big file smaller by reducing redundant data and using like compression algorithms to make things just basically stripping out the bloat and um, encoding it in a way that can be decoded um, later. So these things were originally created for, so UPX is a tool to do this, the most common tool to do it. Um, malware authors use it sometimes. So in the process of it stripping out the bloat, it essentially produces hard to read code. So. Um, yeah, this was originally used for, uh, it was when, when networks were still not as fast, anywhere near as fast as they are now, um, you would, it would matter a lot more, the size of your files that you were sending uh, across the network would have a much bigger impact than it does these days. And back then, uh, packers like UPX were used in order to, so you write a program, you'd compile it down into a binary, then you'd use a packer on it to make it even smaller, and then you'd send it across the network. And then at the other side, they could either run it, because it does it just runs as normal, or you can unpack it to get the original binary back and then run that, uh, if you wanted to like debug against it, for example. Um, so I'll look at the demo now quick. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, it's a picketter.me slash obfuscator. Very simple um, interface. We can choose which language we want. Oh, so they've got C or C++ here. We'll just stick with C. We've got a Hello World. There's some other example programs. We'll just stick with Hello World for now and click Obfuscate. So it's printed out Hello World as this. So it's, first thing it's done you can notice is it's shoved everything on one line. Try and make it smaller other than the include statement. Uh, and then it's used to hex, it, so it's used to hex decimal representations different characters here. So it's opened the string. I'm, I'm assuming this is a capital H probably because then there's an E there. Uh, you can see an L and an O there. So some of the characters have been converted, others haven't. Um, yeah, you can, you can uh, go through it and have a look, but I'll just uh, convert another one. So for example, with this FizzBuzz. So FizzBuzz is a program that 
you sh if you go into programming in interviews, it's very common as like a first check to make sure that uh, it's, it's used very commonly as a first check for, for like, does this person know how to program? Essentially what it does is it's asking you to replace every third number in a list with the word fizz. Uh, it, it, sorry, if a number divides by into three, it gets replaced with fizz, so it'd be like one, two, fizz, four, if it divides by five, it's buzz. If it divides into 15, it's fizz buzz. So you go one, two, fizz, four, buzz, fizz, seven, eight, nine, then buzz, blah, 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 all the way up to, oh, not nine, sorry, nine would be fizz, obviously. But yeah, you got a program, <laughs> you got a program that's doing it for you. Um, so yeah, this is a very common um, programming interview question. If you're not familiar with it, you should um, look up fizz buzz. Anyway, so the code that looks like this has been converted to this, very hard to read. That's the general gist of uh, obfuscation. Okay, so anti-debugging. So as you know now at this point in the course, um, debuggers are super useful. Super useful for uh, de software development and for reverse engineering. Um, basically it's a tool, you, you're well aware, but it's a tool for uh, halting and inspecting and modifying the program's internal state at runtime so that you can uh, see what the program's doing. You can experiment with the program, get it to operate slightly differently. Very useful. Um, and anti-debugging techniques exist, which um, make it di more difficult for analysts to use the debugger. So one way that these kinds of techniques, one technique is uh, debugger detection. So there are some, I'll give you an example of this in a minute, but there are some functions within um, the Windows and the Linux APIs that will let you uh, check whether a debugger is already attached to the process or if, if there's a debugger present. Um, you can use these in order to essentially check if there's a debugger ru is running, um, do this stuff, if not, do something else. So you, this is the same kind of form that's used with the anti-VM and anti-sandboxing techniques that we're about to talk about in a minute where what it's doing is checking if a tool's in use, and if it is in use, do something innocent looking, and if it's not in use, uh, then you can do the malicious behavior. It's a, it's a way of trying to make the binary not um, do the malicious things if it might be getting inspected, essentially. So another technique, so yeah, these are the two functions. So there's is debugger present, and there's ptris, and then there's a, a constant that you can use in Linux. So, the the other uh, another technique is self debugging. So, one of the quirks about how uh, tracing works in pro with processes uh, is that you can only actually have one debugger attached at one time to a process. So, because of this, some programs will actually bake into them. They, 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 as soon as they start running, they'll then attach a, uh, a debugger to themselves, so somebody else can't attach a debugger. Um, so that's one other way of making it uh, more difficult. So yeah, as soon as you run the program, you try to attach a debugger, it'll throw you an error saying this, this can't be traced because it's already being debugged. Something like that. Uh, so timing anal analysis, this is another way uh, that you, some, program, some malware samples uh, do it. So they'll have a check to see how long it took between certain instructions running on like the system clock time and if it's greater than a very short amount of time which would be typical of like standard uh, amount of like processing without a debugger just like normal running on a, on a standard system even on a slow system uh, it wouldn't pop uh, it, it shouldn't trigger but they might have some conditions in there where it says if it's it's essentially trying to pick up on breakpoints, right? So when you use a debugger, you can add a breakpoint and it halts the program at a certain point. Uh, if it halts the clock time, the system clock is still ticking, right? Um, and yeah, if there's too much of a differential between the uh, the ex uh, the instructions that are getting executed and like how and what timestamp it was, yeah, the the program can do something similar to. Uh, when it's the tech figured out that it's been being debugged and just do something else. You can branch conditionally on it. So exception analysis. So this is another way of doing it. Um, so the debugger actually, having a debugger attached will modify the 
way the program runs versus not having a debugger attached and you can cause exceptions so that the um, essentially so, some exceptions that you can cause the program to make um, will leave artifacts that or they'll they'll leave a trace that like certain behaviors that they're doing um, are typical of a debugger so you can kind of like figure out whether a debugger has been running based on the way um, certain exceptions uh, change the profile of the program right so here's another example here um, I will open a terminal and run this code but I'll leave it there for a minute so that you can see so this is the example of the uh, in, in Linux the ptrace trace me it's essentially checking if the process is being debugged if it is just one thing if it's not does something else all it's doing is printing out if it's being debugged or not uh, I'll just compile this and show you the demonstration okay so I've just created a text file uh, a C program file called ptrace oh. so just copied the um, code from the lab slides here and we've got um, so yeah we've got the call uh, conditional check where we're calling to ptrace ptrace me less than zero is the second parameter and making sure that it's uh, less than zero if it's less than zero that indicates that the process has been debugged so in this case we're just x in immediately um, and otherwise we can tell it's not being debugged so if this was a, like a malware sample that was trying to mask its uh, behavior this is where all the, the bad stuff would be happening so to speak so uh we'll do gcc ptrace dot ptrace me output as ptrace underscore trace me so we can do this ptrace underscore trace me it's not being debugged and then if we run it with gdb and run we can tell this process is being debugged so you can include conditional statements in your program to check if it's been debugged and change the operations of your program, uh, just like that. So one last thing to mention about this, and um, I'll show you an example of it in a bit with one of the other programs, but this is, e even though you can include this, this line of code to uh, determine whether the uh, binary's been traced or not, you can, um, this is actually bypassable if you have the binary you can patch the binary just to remove this condition and um, just change it so that it's always uh, returning false uh, that's one way of doing it you can edit the jumps in the assembly to make it so that it always jumps to this condition so there are there are ways of bypassing things that are in the binary um, and that's that's one of them all right, so next example. Um, so we're looking now at anti-VM and anti-sandboxing techniques. So same kind of thing. We're looking to try and detect the environment that the program's been run within and change our behavior depending on that. So some examples, I've, let, I've got some images here. Sandboxy, popular uh, sandbox. We've got QEMU, which is a virtualization um, provider. Same with these other two, VirtualBox VMware. So, uh, we are going to, so yeah, if we're looking at anti-VM techniques, um, you can look for artifacts and conditions. So when you're using virtualization or sandboxes, they modify the environment in a way that they leave artifacts often on the, um, on the system. So one of the things we can do is we can look for hardware ID values. So some of the things that you may be familiar with are that like virtual box sets um, MAC addresses so the, the next thing we're looking for vnic and uh, MAC values so it'll set a, a specific MAC address you can obviously randomize these but the defaults are indicative that it's running from a virtual box system um, you can look in the registry there are entries made uh, you can also look for files that support virtualization things like that this um, C Windows system 32 vbox hook.dll so a DLL that is used in order to make VirtualBox work. So a lot of these virtualization things, they, they need code on the system to, in order to make them work. And you can 
if, uh, as a program, as, uh, as, as a programmer, you can write a program that looks for these artifacts. And if they're there, you can change the operation of your program depending on um, depending on whether it's in a virtual machine or not. Okay, so got an example for you now. Um, I'll go through a demo. Uh, got some code on the right hand side. Essentially, what we're doing here is we're locating an app. We're trying to look for an artifact that exists in a, a virtual machine environment. So, as a demonstration, I'll show you um, the same program running on Activity and uh, running on my laptop on just on bare metal and it'll operate in a different way on both. So simple enough, uh, I've included a function on the right hand side which just checks if a file exists, just run stat on the file name um, and we've got, we're using that function to check if this uh, file etc init.d qemu guest agent, um, so activity uses qemu um, for virtualization so it has this guest agent um, so we're checking if that exists if it does it'll print do nothing because it's in a virtualization analysis environment uh, if it doesn't then it'll do bad stuff it'll just print bad stuff okay, okay so yeah. another example now I've uh, just copied the code from the lab sheet here um, so yeah we're, we're looking for this string uh, we're checking if the file exists we've got a little function to check file exists Checking if this file exists. If it does, we print do nothing. Otherwise, we do bad stuff. So um, I've compiled it just with the. I'll just recompile it just so you can see that it's the same program. So gcc and vm.c. Yep. So now I'll run it and we'll expect it to print do nothing because it's within a virtualized environment. Okay, now I will load this up on my laptop, same program, and show you the difference. Okay, so <clears throat> now we're looking at anti-sandbox techniques. So these uh, follow a similar form to those that we were talking about before with the anti-VMs or detecting whether um, the environment is indicating that there is some uh, analysis going on. So we're looking for sandboxes this time. And one of the quirks of sandboxes is that they have a, a usually, typically in, within a sandbox, there will be like a dummy web server that automatically responds to any uh, re web requests that get made uh, outbound. Uh, and that's a way for the uh, sandbox to be able to track what um, outbound network tra connections uh, or traffic that this that the programs that you're running is trying to actually make. So it'll dummy it and um, respond back. Now, one of the uh, techniques that are used by malware authors to detect anti-sandbox, uh, to detect whether they're running within a sandbox, it leverages this by essentially sending out a web request to a domain that you don't expect to be registered. And if it is returning back uh, with a response, then it's probably being uh, run within a sandbox. Okay, so um, other approaches, rather than just checking for external uh, domain names that shouldn't exist, um, are to look at the window tile names. So at the top of the window, the title of um, whatever the window is might have uh, the name of a known tool, for example, either a sandboxy or it might be a known tool such as uh, Ghidra or Ida. So the, these things don't just necessarily only apply to any sandboxing. Uh, you can use them to detect any tools really for the, um, for the window tile. And also you've got uh, checking the names of brain processes, which is useful as well. So you can check if Ghidra is running or if Ida or any of these other tools like Radare are running. So uh, as an example, this was used prominently in uh, in the WannaCry attacks in 2017, the mal uh, ransomware um, worm that spread and caused havoc. So the kill switch, so there's an article here linked that I would suggest you read uh, because it gives you a breakdown of what actually happened uh, from the perspective of the, the person who actually stopped the attack and as it as the title suggests it was it was actually an accident so um, Mike Hutchins is a 
blogs under the name Malware Tech. Um, he he's the one who was credited with stopping this attack. Uh, essentially, he's a malware uh, analyst. He was looking through WannaCry when it dropped. Um, noticed this strange, I guess, like DNS requests going out to um, this long, strange looking URL. And he noticed that it's not registered, so he registered it. Um, and as soon as he registered it, this, the, the sample stopped spreading itself. Um, so he, this actually turned out to be a poorly thought out anti-forensics, anti-reverse engineering technique, where the sample was trying to check if it was within the sandbox by uh, looking up this random domain name, like it's highlighted below. Um, and yeah, it, it, as, as soon as Marcus Hutchins registered it, um, then it's going to start responding to any requests. So the sample actually thinks it's within a sandbox, which it's not, so it stops doing anything. So sometimes it can backfire um, on the malware authors, and this is an example of that. Um, okay, so we'll look now at disassembly, anti-disassembly. So disassembling machine code is actually a hard problem. It's difficult to, it's based on the way that the methods uh, that are used to pass the uh, machine code into assembly instructions. There are some limitations due to there being ma multiple, in certain cases, certain edge cases, there's multiple valid interpretations of the same uh, raw machine code into different, uh, different assembly instructions. So um, this was more of an issue in the past. Nowadays, mo uh, most modern versions of Ghidra and Ida can handle most cases. Uh, if you look online and if you go through the examples that are within the um, textbook that we um, have us reading for the course, there's an anti-disassembly section in there. And some of those examples won't work with Ghidra, but they'll still work with Ida. Some of them won't work with the current versions of Ida uh, or any, like th they're basically trying to handle these things uh, with clever techniques. So this is an example that's in your log, uh, in your um, lab sheet for this week at the top of the lab sheet. I'm not going to talk through it in too much detail. I'm just leaving it here as an example of how uh, the same data can be passed in two different ways. I break this down um, in the in the lab sheet. So yeah, I suggest you work through that. But essentially, you can see it on line four. It could either be passed as a jump, so so like the data on line four and five where it goes E B E eight, and then seven four five six three four whatever could be passed as E B, uh, which is a D B instruction, and then an E eight on the next line. So it could be a, a DB in a call or it could be a jump. And then the 7456, 7456 are getting passed as instructions rather than the memory address of secret that we're trying to call. So that's that's just a, a, little, a little illustrative example of how uh, the same data can be passed out into two different ways. And there are t malware offers and people who are trying to make it more difficult to analyze your code can inject instructions in, um, it, they, they can modify the machine code in a way that can introduce some of these ambiguities that might cause your disassembler to trip up. So anti-decompilation, same idea, um, we're, instead of looking at the assembly and disassembly, we're actually looking at the decompilation level. So there might be modified programs or programs that in include certain instructions, assembly instructions, which can confuse the decompiler. So the decompiler will produce an incorrect program listing as an output. So I've got an example here that I will quickly go through. Uh, I'll open up a VM and go through there. Okay, so we have the code here uh, on GitHub. Um, I've, I've just copied this across onto a VM here. So I will, so I've created a file called anti underscore deck dot C, anti decompile. So this C code essentially is introduced a, uh, a definition of a function called brave decompiler. This essentially just injects this assembly code wherever he's added this break decompiler call. Um, so before, so all this is is a program which prints out, calls the function sum, adds two and three together, and it call, so it calls this function sum, then this decompile this code gets injected which breaks the decompiler, it returns a plus b, 
before that gets called, the break decompiler code gets uh, injected here. So it's injected into the main function, it's also injected into the sum function. And um, we can go into Ghidra with this now. So if we go opt Ghidra, Ghidra run. And I'll pause the video just whilst yeah, I the project. got it open now. Let's have a look in functions. Go to the main function. Where are we? Main. So if you look in the main function, it's just completely broken, the decompiler. We can't even see the um, the call to sum to add the two um, add the two numbers up. And if we look in sum, sum is also broken. We just don't have any, read, any, any entry in here at all. So that's an example of um, an attack against the compiler. Uh, where it just breaks the output of the program listing, it makes it very difficult to um, to analyze. So in this case, you'd have to manually uh, inspect the the assembly. You could potentially patch the binary by ripping out that uh, the, the the lines of code that are breaking it. But you'd have to know what is what is breaking it, why it's breaking. So it's quite quite tricky uh, in this case. Okay. Okay, so finally we're looking at another. So one and one way of doing this, I've mentioned a couple of times that you can you can patch the binaries. Uh, there's, there's a way of doing that in Gidra. You can right click on an assembly instruction and patch the instruction, and then re uh, and then export the binary. So you can actually uh, do this to get around those conditional checks. So where those conditions are that are saying if uh, that would be in debug or if there's this uh, file existing we don't want to do this or if this URL uh, is not calling back we don't want to do this there are ways of just patching the code so that it doesn't ever you can just stick NOP instructions in so uh, NOP is just no operation it's uh, x90 the, the op code for it um, yeah you can just override certain instructions that you don't want to run with just no operation um, but problem with that is when we're looking at so th this is why we need code integrity checks right um, if we're a software company that's trying to prevent piracy this is more related to anti-piracy than malware um, to be honest it's it's more about not allowing someone to change your program in in any way and run it um, which is kind of what the like the game industry are trying to do um, yeah, they don't. They don't want you to patch their um, their binaries in a way that you can just run their games without uh, paying for them. Essentially, so there's two ways we can do this. We can either um, before we run the code, the code might be cryptographically signed, which means that we would need to verify. We, we would be able to verify the author, whoever um, whoever wrote the code, and we'd also be able to verify that the code is. What it says it was when the author wrote and signed it. So that's one approach. Other approach is uh, runtime integrity checks. So this is in order to try and stop tampering. So or and also instrumentation in some cases. So instrumentation is a technique used where you inject instructions into a running pro process to get it to the process to operate in different ways, and then you can read information back. Uh, but in that case, you're injecting code into the program. Um, so this is a way of stopping that from happening. It's also a way of stopping you from patching the binary to a limited degree. Um, so there's other things you can stop with function hooks. Um, and yeah, uh, injected code, binary patches. So key thing to note is that you can actually also just patch the integrity checking code. If you can find out where the integrity check is taking place, where, where the code is that's uh, running these checksums usually when it, when I say checksums against the code at runtime, what it'll be doing is it'll have uh, some value stored in the data somewhere, and it'll be essentially uh, running like hash calculations on bits of code to determine that it is what it says it is. There's nothing changed. Um, if you can find out where that's where the program is doing that, you can just override that with NOP instructions. So whenever it calls to see if there's an integrity check, oh, it just does nothing and carries on. Same thing with the timing analysis. So these are some of the techniques uh, that we people can use to make it harder to analyze a program. Uh, but yeah, there are there are workarounds. It's all it's always a cat and mouse game, uh, an arms race. 
Yeah, thank you for listening.